Hello and welcome to the program, Sula's Big Adventures, with me, Sula. This episode is about observing the moon with binoculars or a telescope through an observing program. Did you get a new telescope recently and are you feeling overwhelmed figuring out what to look at? Many seasoned astronomers will tell you that the moon is a great object for beginners to observe and I agree with that, but what should you look at on the moon? After all, there are tens of thousands of features to look at on the moon. With even a small telescope, I have a suggestion. I suggest you try an observing program to give your observations of the moon a little more structure and at the same time teach you how to record your observations and how to hone and improve your observing skills. Probably the most well-known observing programs are run by the Astronomical League. And they have three different lunar observing programs. They have the telescope and binocular lunar program, they have the lunar evolution observing program, and the more advanced lunar 2 observing program. For the beginner, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has the Explore the Moon telescope and Explore the Moon binoculars. And for intermediate, they have the Isabel Williamson lunar observing program. I've found that many astronomy clubs belong to the Astronomical League and they just use the Astronomical League's observing programs. But there are a few other lunar observing programs. There is the East Valley Astronomy Club lunar observing program with over 90 objects you must observe. And there is the Charles Wood Lunar 100 published in Sky and Telescope in April 2004. Charles Wood's Lunar 100 references a moon atlas by Antonin Ruckel. <laughs> I checked on Abe's books and the Antonin Ruckel moon atlas is now over $100 used and $300 new. For a much cheaper option, I would suggest the $11 Orion moon map or for a little more, the $31 21st century atlas of the moon by Charles Wood. It has superb photos of lunar features and there are also free maps of the moon on the internet, but you're going to need to take the map outside with you with your telescope or binoculars. So it might be more convenient to have a written map, unless you don't mind taking your laptop or tablet or even your phone. There are some apps you can get on your phone with lunar maps. For example, there's the Loonscope. I've never used it, but you could try that. But in looking over the various programs, I personally didn't care for the Astronomical League's basic lunar observing program. I agree with Charles Wood that your observations of the moon should be something that leads to an understanding of our satellite, how it developed and the forces at work there that created all these features. If you like the Astronomical League's lunar observing, basic lunar and binocular lunar observing program though, Here's the link. Look over the requirements though, because you'll want to submit your paperwork at the end and get a certificate or a pen or whatever they offer as a reward for your effort. The Astronomical League's Lunar 2 program looked interesting, but it requires you to complete a number of sketches in order to complete the program. But if you're just starting out in astronomy, I would recommend something more basic that you can start with you don't want to become overwhelmed when the whole point of this is to use the program to alleviate some of your stress about what to look at. The Charles Wood Lunar 100 looks like an interesting lunar observing program, but there's no certificate or pen involved, and some of the objects require an 8 inch or larger telescope. If you have a small telescope of 3 or 4 inches, or just a pair of binoculars, then I would recommend the East Valley Astronomical Club. 
out of Mesa, Arizona. They have a lunar observing program of 90 objects, or the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Explore the Moon Telescope or Explore the Moon Binoculars. You don't need to be a member to participate in their programs. You just download the list of objects you need to observe and the observing forms and maps. But if you want the pen or the certificate, then you must be a member in good standing. It used to cost $35 for your membership and you get a free copy of the Observer's Handbook. But recently I was advised by the Royal Astronomical Society that they had been undercharging members living in the United States, i.e. me, <laughs> and that they would be increasing the price. I don't know by how much, but I, I will maintain my membership because I think it's a well-run astronomy club with excellent resources and because I'm very impressed with their emphasis on observational astronomy, something dear to my heart. Since I'm a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and because I like their Observe the Moon program, that's the one that I decided to participate in. Their website states that the program is meant for beginners with a small telescope. I am not a beginner <laughs> by any means. But believe it or not, I've never in over 35 years of being an amateur astronomer tried to complete an observing program to do with the moon. I am more of a deep sky, faint fuzzy kind of astronomer, but it is about time for me to give the moon a closer look. After all, the moon is up there day after day and you can view it from anywhere. It doesn't matter if your backyard or other observation site is light polluted and unlike galaxies, nebulae, and constellations, which fade from view after a few months and don't return again for several more months, the moon is up there month after month after month. It won't go away. In 2022, I downloaded the forms, the list, the moon map, and I started the Explore the Moon Telescope program. I made two huge mistakes that I'll tell you about so you don't repeat my errors. Number one, I failed to read all of the available resources on the website and in the uh, Observer's Handbook. And they have information in there about how they like for you to keep your observation log. That was mistake number one. Mistake number two was that I own several telescopes and they do not stay in a closet. <laughs> I pull all of them out on a regular basis and I use those telescopes for the Observe the Moon program. Well, that was a bad idea because as I explained in my video about locating objects with your telescope, different telescopes have different orientations, which is unimportant for visual astronomy, except when observing the moon. I was so confused after looking through my Dobsonian one day and then the next day looking through a refractor that I would spend the first 30 minutes just trying to figure out where I was on the moon. And that was mistake number two. Eventually, after a year, I completed the program. I had seen all the mandatory objects. I believe there are 97 mandatory ones, plus the optional objects, which are mostly landing sites of various moon missions. And I submitted my logbook to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and I waited. Someone named Blake contacted me and advised me that my application had been rejected because my descriptions of my observations were inadequate, according to them. I was highly disappointed. <laughs> But this guy, Blake, he encouraged me to try again. So in February 2023, I started all over. I tried to limit myself to a 90 millimeter refractor in Montana and my eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain in California to make it easier. I skipped all of the <laughs> optional objects, but I, I saw and I recorded all of the 97 mandatory objects. Sometime in late 2023, I learned that Blake had passed away. I, I felt bad because he had been helping me and he even called me on the phone one day while I was in Montana. But as I live in a very rural area with poor cellular reception, I missed his call. And we never connected with each other before 
he passed away. I have to confess that while I like looking at the moon, when it comes to astronomy, I mostly enjoy looking at nebulae and galaxies. But I felt so bad about Blake dying that I decided I had to finish the Explore the Moon program. The moon is a great object for a beginner. It's easy to find. You can see a lot on the moon with even a small telescope. And you can observe it during the day sometimes and at night. And by recording your observations, it'll help you hone your observational skills. Mercinius, flooded crater, large eroded crater west of Mare Humorum. Last object on my Observe the Moon telescope version observing program. Second time. The first time they rejected my paperwork. Now I just have to submit my paperwork again and hope they give me the certificate this time. And it's a good thing I finished tonight because my friend Katie is coming to visit in a couple of weeks and she said she's going to be taking the 90 millimeter refractor back. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has a unique way of listing the lunar objects and the ideal time for viewing each object. Instead of telling you the best day to see the features on the moon according to the days after new moon, the Royal Astronomical Society lists the object's ideal viewing time by the number of days before first quarter and after first quarter. So for example, it might say to look at Mare Crisium on Q day minus five, that means five days before first quarter. It took me a while to get used to this, but I eventually did. For each feature you see, you must list the observer and no one can help you to find each object. You have to find it yourself and you must see it yourself and record it yourself. Each observation must include the date, the time, the location, the sky conditions, the telescope used, the magnification, and any observing remarks or details you noticed. You're encouraged to include drawings, but it's not mandatory and it cannot replace observing notes. The included list of objects has a column on the log page to cross-reference your observations to your log book or your observing record. I kept detailed notes of each observation and I included the required information for each one. Finally, in November 2023, I had seen all the mandatory objects. I scanned all the pages of my logbook, I filled out the application, and I emailed twice to the observing committee, who had until recently been Blake. After no response for two weeks, I went into town 20 miles away to mail my logbook with uh, via international mail and a very unreliable and unstable U.S. mail service in rural Montana. <laughs> my area has had four different mail carriers in one month and my mailbox is six miles away and sometimes the mail carrier will just put a delivery package on top of my mailbox even if it's snowing or windy. As you can see it's an absolutely gorgeous day here in California but it's way too noisy here, so I'm going to have to complete this inside. I mailed my logbook via international mail on November 27th, and I'm still waiting to find out if I've been rejected again. I won't be surprised if they reject me again. As Blake told me, the first time I submitted a logbook, it was for Explore the Universe program, for which they did give me a certificate and a pen. I have an unorthodox way of keeping observing notes. Honestly, I don't like things to be so structured that it takes all the fun out of astronomy. After all, it's my logbook and it's very personal. It's a personal journey of mine and it's my diary. I'm not a scientist submitting my theories to the community for disputation. I just think using their list of objects and resources for lunar observing is very helpful, especially if you've never done it before. But even if they don't give me the pen or certificate, I'll still be the better for having completed the Observe the Moon telescope program twice. I learned a lot about the moon, its creation, its features, 
and my observing skills over the course of completing this program twice have definitely improved. I learned to be patient and to take my time at the eyepiece to note fine details in each object and not rush, and I think I'm a better observer for having done so. And if you're a beginner or you just got your new telescope and you'd like some structure for your lunar observing, then I highly recommend to participate in a lunar observing program. It'll also help your observational skills. You can try one of the programs that I've mentioned in this presentation. But take advantage of the wealth of information and resources available on the Astronomical League's website and uh, other clubs' websites on how to approach your lunar observing and how to record your observations. Be sure to be as descriptive as possible for each observation. Here are some ideas for things that you can include in your observation log about the moon. For craters, can you note if the floor is smooth or uniform and whether it's a complex crater with a central peak and with overlapping craters, can you determine which crater was created first? And are the crater walls uniform? Can you detect any ejecta or material blasted out during impact beyond the crater walls? For Maria, does it appear level or uneven? Do you see any rills or dorsa, which are wrinkled ridges? And can you detect any rupees or cliffs created as areas of the lunar surface cooled and subsided, such as the straight wall? And can you observe valleys in mountain ranges or between craters, such as the Alpine Valley? And does going back to the same object 30 minutes later change how the object appears in your telescope or binoculars? Have any new details appeared or have some items disappeared? And does using a polarizing filter change the view? And speaking of polarizing filters, I strongly recommend that you get one to use to observe the moon because once the moon is past first quarter, it will become increasingly bright as each day goes by to the point that when you point your telescope to the moon, it will temporarily blind you <laughs> if you don't use a filter. I use the Mead variable polarizing filter and it works pretty well. Finally, let me tell you a little bit about the requirements for recording the sky conditions. You must include this information in your logbook, the transparency and the seeing conditions. I use the one recommended by the Astronomical League because it's easy to use and it doesn't take a long time. You look at the little dipper for transparency and if you cannot see Polaris, then the transparency is one. Very bad. If you can only see Polaris, then the transparency is two, which is still very bad. If you can see Polaris, Cocab, and Faircad, then it's three. If you can see any stars in the tail, plus those, it's four. If you can see the other two stars in the bowl, it's five. If you can see all seven stars of the stick figure of the Little Dipper, it's six. And if you can see some outside of the stick figure, it's seven, and that's excellent for gauging the seeing. If the atmosphere is turbulent, it's one, two, even the planets are twinkling, three, the planets are twinkling a little bit, four, the stars are twinkling slightly, but not the planets, and five, not even the stars are twinkling, and that is excellent time to look at the moon and the planet. So I'll let you know if I ever get my certificate and or pin for Explorer the Moon Telescope from the Royal Astronomical Society, but either way, I hope I've encouraged you to point your telescope at the moon, the easiest celestial object for a beginner to explore and suitable for intermediate and even experienced astronomers. Take notes of your observations and even sketch them if you can, and even consider submitting your logbook for a pen and certificate or just keep your logbook to look at in later years. You'll be glad you did, and you'll feel great satisfaction and accomplishment for having completed a program, even if you don't submit your logbook for a pen or certificate. 
and you'll have increased your knowledge and your ability to observe more in the night sky. So that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all soon. Until then, get outside and enjoy the night sky and look at the moon. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off.